so they came, at a friend's behest. Heroes once celebrated as saviors of Eorzea, brought low through treachery, their names blackened with royal blood. With memories of the lost and dreams of redemption, with hope yet in their hearts, they came. Ishgard, shining city on the mount, overlooking the dominion of Curthus. A great and proud nation, devoted to Helone, the Fury, ruled by Thordin VII, Archbishop of the Ishgardian Orthodox Church. The last bastion of the faith her walls ever bristling with the sworn swords and spears of her four high houses. A land that after a thousand years of war had forgotten what it was to be at peace. Through gates long closed, the warrior of light and her companions passed, entering at last a city whose history was written in blood. In the midst of the Dragonsong War they came, three weary travelers whose arrival would set in motion great change. Though none knew then how great. To the frozen wastes of the Western Highlands, once verdant tracts made pallid by the calamity. Beyond the towering wall of ice, to lands long forsaken that the Knights of Ishgard strove tirelessly to reclaim. To the hamlet of Falcon's Nest, once abandoned, now freed of its pall of snow and ash, she came. Upon an airship, conceived within the fecund mind of Sid Garland, renegade prodigy of Garlemald, who had come to call Eorzea home. High into the heavens, 
where isles of earth and stone floated as clouds, a frontier the knights of Ishgard had scarce begun to explore. To a fledgling outpost within the sea of clouds, where careworn scouts ever scanned the skies for winged shadows, she came. Beyond Abalathia's spine, the great mountain range that spans the continent of Aldenard from east to west, into the deepening shadows of Som Arl, where lies the ancient home of dragon kind. To a land where the soil slithers and the sky seethes with sinuous shapes, they came. To the peak of Som Arl, at the end of a perilous mountain path, whence could be seen a string of pearl-like islands floating in possibly atop a sea of clouds. to a domain where dragons and men had once lived in harmony, whose majesty no mortal eye had glimpsed for nigh on a thousand years, they came. to the northern reaches of the Sea of Clouds, where countless isles yet remained uncharted. In search of a mysterious land known as Azizla and the unmasked villain who sought to claim its secrets. Oblivious to the new threat which followed in their wake, they came. To the Thaliac River, where to the melted snows of Abalathia's spine eventually find their way by means of a thousand silver streams. whose waters have long nourished the Trevanian hinterlands, and so provided for a settlement of learned souls from across the northern seas. To the city of Charlian, that great seat of knowledge now abandoned by her keepers, they came. So ends a glorious chapter in their tale. However, tumultuous days yet lie ahead for Ishgard. 
After a thousand years under the yoke of the church, the people take their first tentative steps into the unknown. <laughs> and though they spy a glimmer of peace upon the horizon, Nidhogg's vengeful shadow yet remains to darken the way. Be that as it may. So long as the young commander of the Temple Knights and his heroic companions are there to guide them, the people may hold fast to hope. The hope that one day, true peace will return to Ishgard, and that man and dragon may live in harmony once more. Let the deeds writ herein never be forgot. That they may inspire generations yet unborn to strive ever heavensward. In the wake of the Archbishop's fall, the nation of Ishgard trembled, the faith of her people shaken to its very core. For a thousand years had they fought and died, certain of the justice of their cause, only to be told that their holy war was born of the sins of their forefathers. What then for those brave men and women, thus stripped of their righteousness but to despair, to deny the truth and decry its speakers? And what then for those whom they defamed but to hope on, to have faith in a brighter tomorrow? A tomorrow in which man and dragon might live together in harmony, then as distant as the very stars in the heavens. Yet while we dared to hope, deep within his lair the enemy lay, gathering his strength. Nidhogg, now possessed of his two eyes and the body of the Azure Dragoon, prizes to which he had laid claim at the very hour of the hero's triumph. As desperately as we sought the solace of peace, the great worm craved the misery of war, nor was he alone in his misbegotten desire. Those were the days of promises and vows, of tentative first steps into an uncertain future. A future shaped by the choices we made in ways we could never have foreseen. Born of good and evil, of light and darkness, and shepherded by our hand. Be it for weal, or be it for woe. change. That great inexorable wave was upon us, and soon all of Ishgard would bend to its will. For all our sins, for all our scars, the future for which we had long yearned was at last within our grasp. But, it would be bought at a heavy price. For in those twilight hours, 
did Nidhogg cry out for vengeance, and his brethren raised their voices for the final chorus of the Dragon Song War. The conference held at Falcon's Nest was to be a celebration of the reconciliation twixt man and dragon. But the lingering shade of Nidhogg, clad in the flesh of the Azure Dragoon, did mark the occasion by spilling the blood of his own kind. A timely atrocity to remind the children of Ishgard that the Dragon Song War was far from over. And when fear gave way to fury, the call to arms rang out anew. Death to Nidhogg. Death to Nidhogg. Following the battle with Nidhogg on the steps of faith, Sir Emery called an assembly that he might make his final proclamation as acting head of state. Twas there, with one decree, that the thousand-year rule of the archbishops was ended, paving the way for a new republic. The governance of Ishgard would now be placed in the hands of high and lowborn alike, their ranks represented by the newly founded House of Lords and House of Commons. Church was separated from state. The foundation for change had been carefully laid, and the reforms proposed by Ishgard's new government passed into law without incident. His duty done, Emmerich de Burel gladly stepped down from the Archbishop's dais, only to be raised unto the highest seat in the House of Lords. Though he strove at first to refuse this honor, the unexpectedly strident voice of the Count de Durandere left him little choice but to accept. And so it was that the winds of gentle revolution came to stir. Prominent among the many honored guests at Sir Emmerich's investiture were the ambassadors of Dragonkind, a fitting symbol of Ishgard's newfound peace. People looked on in awe as he soared through the heavens on dragon back. And by their cheers did they hail him an azure dragoon for a new age.
Thus were the notes of the dragon song rewritten. The din of war giving way to a rising litany of peace and hope. Thank <laughs> you. 